If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 28. We are going to start a message series today on the book of Exodus. We're going to read through Exodus, <clears throat> but to get to Exodus, there's a little bit of setup in Luke chapter 9, verse 28. We're going to throw the scriptures up on the screen for you if you don't have a Bible. If you do, follow along with us. Luke 9, verse 28. This is the moment that Jesus is transfigured, referred to as the transfiguration. Luke 9, 28 says this. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. I wanted to start this off this morning because it's important for where we're going and how we read the book of Exodus. What I mean by this, what I mean by that is this, this is a situation where Jesus goes up to the top of this hill. He's hanging out with some of his closest friends. And in an instant, he's transfigured, transformed into a glorified state. Now you're talking about like top 10 moments in history that you would want to be at. This has got to be in the top five. Hanging out on the side of a mountain with Jesus, just a couple of close friends. You think you're there for a prayer meeting and all of a sudden he turns into bright, dazzling white light. And not just that, but Moses and Elijah show up. Now, a lot of us in here are not Jewish people. We don't have a Jewish heritage. So Moses and Elijah showing up are kind of just the equivalent of some other cool biblical character showing up. But for these guys, Peter and John and James, this was... This was like the equivalent of like the entire Avengers Infinity War movie where the, in every, the entire cast, every superhero you could imagine is all in one place. For them, that's this. Because Moses represents the law, which was the basis of everything that the Jewish people built their life on. And Elijah was the symbol of the prophets. And together with the law and the prophets in one place talking to Jesus, you have every cornerstone of history coming together on one mountain and having a conversation. That's what's happening in this moment. Do not read this so fast in your Bible plans that you just skip down to verse 32 and you keep going and you miss this moment. Pause and reflect on what's actually happening here. Because what they're talking about is his departure. Now you miss it in English because in Greek, that word departure is the word exodus. Now follow me here. Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah about the Exodus, but not the Exodus from the book of Exodus. They're talking about the next Exodus. They're talking about Jesus being a better Moses, freeing not just the people of Israel from slavery, but going to the work on the cross, being put in the ground, raising to life three days later so that not just Jewish people can be free, but the entire world can experience the salvation and the exodus of slavery from sin. That's the beauty of this. Jesus is teaching at this moment to us and to Peter, James, and John that he is the culmination of everything that the Old Testament is preaching. What we'd refer to as the Old Testament from Genesis forward, everything in there is a subtle hint to something's coming, something's coming, something's better is coming, something amazing is coming. And it's, it's wrapped in this shadow to help you prepare your hearts for what is coming. So you have these little clues that there's this thing happening and on its own merit, this is cool, like King David, for example, he's a great king and he likes to sing and worship and he's got a kind heart and he cares for people. That's a great thing but uh, on itself. But that is just such a small portion that, uh, of, of the story of Israel 
that doesn't just stand on its own for David. It actually casts a shadow into the future to help prepare our hearts to see when Jesus shows up. Hey, do you guys remember how King David was such an amazing king and he cared for the people and he put the ark out in the front so that it wasn't hidden in tent for, for just some, some priests to see, but it was out in front for everybody to see. You remember that? And you're like, yeah, yeah, I love I love King David. He's my man. Well, Jesus is like that, but even better. So if I come to you and just explain, man, Jesus is this great guy, you're like, okay, I, I get it. But if he starts being um, compared to these other amazing people in history and saying, do you remember how great it was back then? Do you remember these amazing things? It's like that, but better. This wraps back in our message series last week when we talked about this concept of the kingdom of God is like a treasure. You walk through your entire life thinking everything that you've saved up is worth something until you're slapped in the face with Jesus. And then you realize that he is supremely better than anything you have ever stored up. And you will gladly trade all of it for him because he is better. And Peter, James, and John are sitting on a mountain watching Jesus have a conversation with their idols. And it's starting to dawn on them, Jesus is better Moses was pointing to Jesus. I, I'm guilty of worshiping him because he was the man, but all he was was just a figure to point me to the man. I thought Elijah was amazing with the miracles he performed, but all that we were doing, well, Jesus was, all God was doing with, with Elijah was using his life to prepare our hearts that something else is coming. I'll give you another example. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 27. As soon as Jesus raises from the dead, the first thing he does... He starts walking, he shows up on the road to Emmaus and he starts having a conversation with these guys and he kind of plays dumb. These guys are like, yeah, they got these long faces and Jesus is like, what you upset about? And they look at him like, are you the only person on the history of the planet and the world that has no idea what's going on? Do you really know why we're not sad? Like they just murdered our king. We, man, we just love this guy named Jesus and now he's gone. And at the end of Luke 24 in verse 27, it says that Jesus spent... The rest of that walk from Moses through the prophets explaining how everything pointed to Jesus. Now that's probably like top five amazing moments. That's probably like, that's tied for like one or two. Listening to Jesus teach about himself, I'm there for that every single day of the week. I'll listen to Jesus talk about himself. And he's walking through Exodus and using Moses to reveal himself. And so he's saying all the stuff you knew before, let me show you what you missed about it. There are things in here about me and you just took them at surface value. Let me explain something. The Exodus, it's about me. Moses he was, he, 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 I'm, 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 I'm the better Moses, the, um, the, the Passover, the mountain, the law, the Red Sea, the priesthood, the sacrifices, everything, everything is about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. Now, this is not me making this bold claim. This is Jesus making this bold claim. So you don't have to take my word for it. You can take his word for it. He thought it was so important that when he rose from the dead, he started teaching people that everything was about him. He even did it while he was alive with Peter, James, and John. Guys, look, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Joshua, all of it, it's not just the story of the people of Israel. It is the play, it is the stage, it is the shadow that I am casting to get your hearts ready for something even better. If you can swallow the fact that I would free a nation from slavery in Egypt, then you can start to digest the fact that I also have the power to free the entire world from the slavery of sin. If you have a hard time swallowing the fact that God raised up a baby in the middle of a culture of murder, saved him, and then used him to bring deliverance to a, to a people, if you have a hard time with that, but you, but you can get it, you can, cut, you can follow Exodus and you're okay with Moses, then let me tell you that you are now, your heart is primed to be able to receive a story about another guy who was born in the middle of a mass genocide of children who will eventually grow up and lead the entire world out of slavery. So my goal for this summer, 
and I'm casting past just Exodus, is I want us to read Exodus and Joshua together, and then we're going to read Hebrews. Over the next couple months, throughout the rest of the summer, we're going to read Exodus, we're going to read Joshua, and then we're going to read Hebrews. And the reason why I want to do this, and some of you are like, man, that's a big sandwich. That's a mouthful. Exodus is 40 chapters. How are you going to do that? Watch me. (laughs) We're doing this because I, first and foremost, want you to know your heritage. As American Christians, we have a tendency to think that Jesus is just like our personal thing, that we, he discovered us, we discovered him, and apart from him standing alone, there's really no other history. That we're his chosen people, well, I'm, I'm his, and he is mine, and that's kind of it. But you are one person in a grand story that has been taking place thousands of years before you were ever born. And Jesus was Jewish. And he has an entire culture that he was brought up in. He has festivals that he celebrated as a Jewish boy that most of us were like, I don't understand any of that. And for, for, for salvation purposes, for growing maturity, that's okay. I'm not telling you that you have to learn the Jewishness of Jesus, but I'm telling you it would be the difference between just eating a plate of French fries and eating a plate of French fries with some of that good Gordo sauce and seasoning on it. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's a difference between eating a good meal and eating a well-seasoned meal. And that's what reading through the Old Testament does. It brings out the flavors. It brings out the heritage that's behind all of this salvation. Yes, Jesus freed us. He's our great high priest. But where does that concept of priesthood come from? It comes from somewhere. So my desire is for you to understand your heritage. I also want you to understand God's faithfulness in ways that we have belittled it in the past. God's faithfulness is larger than just what he does for you in your life. God's faithfulness is thousands of years in the making. I want you to see what holy living looks like from the word of God. And most of all, I want your heart to be stirred with affections for Jesus. And I want you to read the Old Testament with me, and I want that to be the end goal. I want you to read things you've read a hundred times with new eyes and a new desire to be stirred on the inside so that your worship looks differently. Our worship this morning was powerful. It moved me. And partly because in the middle of worship, while we're singing these songs about the rocks crying out, and I'll do that too, I've got uh, a month of preparation and and planning of reading through the book of Exodus and training myself. I don't want to just read this like I always read it. I don't want to just read the burning bush like I've always read it. I want to read it knowing that Jesus is coming. I don't want to read the birth of Moses like I've always read it. I want to read it knowing this is a type of Christ. This is a shadow of what's coming even better. And if I can start reading that way, then my heart is tuned for what is next because Jesus is coming again. And we are living in a season where these things that have been given to us from the word of God as gifts to prepare our hearts should be doing just that, preparing our hearts for what's next. Not just trying to get by on a daily basis and be the best you you can be, but actually molding your heart into a place where when he shows up, you are ready, you are expectant, you are wanting it to happen. So let me give you a little background on Exodus, and while I'm doing that, go ahead and turn to Exodus chapter 1. We've got 40 chapters, and I'm a fast reader, so follow along. I'm just kidding, we're not going to read all of it. But I would recommend that if you're a note taker, this is a great series to do it. We record every message and we put it online for free. So if you want to go back and listen to it again, I just want to set your expectations. The reason, the way that we're going to approach Exodus and Joshua is we are not getting down into the nitty gritty details. I'm not going to spend a lot of time about, um, well, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? The purpose of this is to read through what we've read before, but train ourselves to see it in a new way, like the way Jesus would have taught the guys on the road to Emmaus. The background of Exodus is it was written primarily, mainly by this guy named Moses. It, the Exodus itself, where Israel was freed from slavery in Egypt, took place probably as early as 1400 BC. 
Some historians say it's uh, later, could be as late as 1200, but for our purposes, we're just going to land right around 1400, 1450, somewhere around there. That's probably when this took place. We're going to study Exodus in five main parts. First, we're going to cover Moses. We're going to cover the plagues. We're going to cover the actual Exodus. We're going to cover Mount Sinai, and then we're going to cover the covenant. That's how I want to break up this book. So today we're going to get to Moses. Let's start in Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Now, it's at this point that we start tuning out, like names, nah, just genealogies, can I, where's the next one? But I want you to slow down and just think, read this with me. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt, and then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. These are not just 12 sons. These boys are the foundation for God's redemptive plan in the world. And if you spend any time reading through Genesis, that is laughable. These boys are a disaster. They make some of the worst choices. They sell their youngest brother into slavery because they can't stand him. This family is a nightmare. And God chooses to bring the redemption of the entire world through these boys. And it starts with just 70 people. But from these 12 boys come kings and prophets and priests and miracle workers and servants and redeemers and Jesus. Through this family mess comes our Jesus. That says a lot about how he chooses to work his plan. It's not with the best looking family on the block. He works deeply in the most broken families. At this point in our story, Israel has been in Egypt for almost 400 years. They've adopted new customs. They've forgotten a lot about God. But God has promised this family back in Genesis 12 and again in Genesis 17 that he is going to make the descendants of Abraham, that's who these boys are, multiplied across the entire earth and he's going to redeem the world through them. And this chapter outlines the beginning of that promise. Pick up in verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many. They're too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pitho and Ramesses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Now, when it says in verse 8, they did not know Joseph, this is a reference to the Joseph back in verse 5. If you read through the end of Exodus, essentially what happened, and you probably remember the story, was that there was a, the, the brothers sold their youngest brother into uh, slavery, Joseph, and he eventually ended up in Egypt as a slave, rose to power because of God's providence became second in command, and eventually a famine struck the land, and his 12 brothers had to come begging at Joseph for supplies. 
They didn't know it was Joseph at the time. And through a series of events, Joseph forgives them and says, the best thing for you to do is not to keep coming back and forth from what is modern day Israel to modern day Egypt in the middle of a famine to pick up supplies at the grocery store. The best thing for you to do is just move the family down here with me. I've got plenty of room and I'm in charge. So the whole family moves down and there's 70 of them when they move in. And now over the course of about 400 years, they have grown to almost 2 million people. And Egypt looks around and Pharaoh says, we've got a problem on our hands. I don't know who Joseph is and I don't know why all of these Jewish people are here and why they're having so many babies. But if we don't get a handle on these people, there's going to be more of them than there's us and there won't be in Egypt anymore. So the best thing that we can do is let's make them slaves and force them to build stuff with us. That is the first mistake that Egypt makes. And so at this point, that they've started to not just become slaves, but adopt the custom of the people. And over 400 years, they've forgotten their God. They've forgotten the covenant of Abraham. And the point that I think is important for us to see here is that they were actually slaves long before they were ever forced to build brick and mortar and clay. The moment that you forget your God and the covenant and his faithfulness, You have sold your soul as a slave to this world. Long before they were ever forced to do labor, they had already sold their souls. They had already adopted a culture and became uh, assimilated into the gods of Egypt and gave their hearts away. And they were slaves to that world long before they were ever forced to make bricks. But the good news is that God is always faithful to his word. And that is immensely good news because we are never good to our own word. Even on our best day, when you can keep your word, there are still things that are working in your heart that are motivating you from dark places to want to keep your word. Self-preservation, not the genuine well-being of I love this person, but if I don't do this person, I'm going to experience the pain that I don't want to experience. And so I will go out of my way to make it look like I'm just a caring, compassionate person. When in reality, if you really boil it down, I'm just in it for myself. Even when we are unfaithful, God is always faithful. And that's the good news for these people. It's good news for us because it's not just a bumper sticker. When we become slaves, when our children are murdered, when we are at the end of our rope, God never, ever forsakes us. Now, when I told you I wanted you to read this with eyes, like we're in the shadow of the cross, this is where it starts. We're not just reading about a situation where Israel is in trouble. We're reading about us. We're also in trouble. We also live in an Egypt in this world that is constantly enticing us to take on their gods and their way of life, and it makes us forget our God. But the good news is that when you forget him, he does not forget you. He is faithful to his word and his covenant, and he always comes through, and he's good at saving you. You are good at getting yourself in trouble, and he is good at saving you. That's what he loves. You read through the rest of Exodus chapter one, the Pharaoh gets so angry that there's so many Jewish people that he orders all of the male children to be killed. Imagine the anxiety of a pregnant mom during this period because there's no ultrasounds. Now, we live in a culture where we're kind of thinking, well, I'm gonna, we're going to have a baby reel party, and we're going to show it off on Instagram, and it's going to be blue and pink, and we're going to know what it is. That's not a thing in this culture. You don't know what you're having until it's breathing air. And so for nine months, you have got a baby in your belly, and Pharaoh says, if it's a boy, it's dead. Imagine living nine months with that anxiety and fear. Pick it up in Exodus chapter two, verse one. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took his wife, a Levite woman, the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. Now that's not just like, this is a good looking baby. (laughs) But this is a fine child. 
No, parents, they knew something about him. This child was anointed. There was something special about this kid. So what did they do? How did they defy the order? When she could hide him no longer, she took him and made a basket of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister, so this child's sister, watched mom put the basket in the river, stood at a distance because she wanted to know what was going to happen to her brother. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. Aren't you glad we don't do that anymore? <clears throat> While her young women walked beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. And when she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews children. That's huge. Pharaoh's daughter knows the rules, but she looks at this Hebrew child, this boy, and she has pity on him. See, this is the first miracle of this book. We think that the miracle starts showing up when the burning bush happens. No, no, this is the first miracle. That God saved this boy in the middle of a culture of murder. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I, so his, this child's sister comes up to Pharaoh's daughter, hey, shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Boy, what a crafty young little girl, huh? <laughs> right? She's, she's like, oh, I see that you have found a child. I see that you see that it's Hebrew. Could I do something? Could maybe I go find one of the, I don't know, one of the two million Hebrew women to come and nurse this child? So the girl went and called the child's mother and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. And she named him Moses because I drew him up out of the water. In the middle of genocide, God saves this kid named Moses. Now follow me here. He's spared from murder. He was raised by good Jewish parents. And the next few verses we're about to learn that as he grows up, he struggles with this culture and this identity of being Jewish, but being raised under the Egyptians. And his decision is that when he sees his own people, the Hebrews being assaulted, he goes and murders this Egyptian and buries his body in the sand. And the Hebrews don't respond well to it. They don't accept him. And so he flees. His own people don't accept him. He flees and he, want, he goes out into the wilderness and he stays in the wilderness until God releases him in chapter three uh, for ministry. So you got a baby within a miraculous birth. You've got a child being raised by good Jewish parents, spending time in the ministry. Do you see the foreshadowing of Jesus? Read this in the shadow of the cross. We know the end of the story. If you can digest that a savior of Israel was raised by Jewish parents, spent time in the woods, like how many clues do we need? If you're watching a movie, you're just like, I know what's going to happen. I totally know what's going to happen. Read it this way. Both being born under the same circumstances. And this is the amazing thing in this story, is that God chooses to raise up salvation and freedom in the culture of slavery and murder. And this happens twice with Moses and with Jesus. It's almost like God takes joy in growing the opposite of a thing in the soil of the unrighteous thing. It's almost like God says, I like bringing redemption in the middle of slavery. I'll actually grow it out of that soil. Because no one's going to look at it and say, of course that soil would grow that. No, everyone's going to look at that and say, that has to be God because those things don't grow here. Freedom, peace, love does not grow out of a culture of hate and murdering children. But God says, I can do anything. I can make anything come out of the worst of circumstances. And that's just the very beginning of the good news of Jesus that we are going to see as we read through the book of Exodus. You've got a bunch of people who like to do nothing but complain. 
They cry out to God and God responds. And immediately as soon as he responds, they don't like the way he responds. Well, I'll tell you, if that was me, if I was God, fine, I'll start over. I'll go over here to the Midianites. Or I'll just wait till another nation rises up. I'll deal with them. I'll offer my plan of redemption to them. God says, no, I'm faithful because I made a promise to Abraham. And I didn't swear to Abraham. I swore against myself. And I don't break promises against myself. I do not change. And so when I say, I swear to God, I mean it. As you read through the... You like that? As you read through the rest of Exodus chapter 2, this is the situation I described that as Moses grows up, he struggles with this identity and he eventually ends up leaving Egypt and wandering out to the land of Midian. He finds a nice young girl and he marries her and becomes a shepherd in the desert. And in verse 23 through 25 of chapter 2, it says, during those many days, the king of Egypt died And the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God and God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. This is an important point as we're reading through this in the shadow of the cross. Israel cried out to God. But this cry is not just Israel's cry. This is a turning point. Because up until this point, you got just a group of people who are supposed to be God's people doing whatever they want. But the moment they realize that things are out of their control and they need help, the first thing they do is they cry out to God. And God always hears. This cry is not the first cry, and it's not going to be the last cry. This cry is going to be followed over the next 3,000 years of the entire world saying, man, can you save us too? You can save Israel, can you save me? This is the cry of every human trafficking victim, every abused spouse, every homeless person, every person living in a war zone, every single mom, every orphan, every person has cried out this prayer once in their life. God, can you save me too? And the cry is always answered the same way. Yes, this is my son, Jesus. He specializes in and saving you. The salvation may not come from your exact specific circumstance right now, but the salvation that's being offered is not freedom from your current circumstances. What's being offered is freedom from eternity of punishment and sin and being separated from God Almighty. And when you cry out, God always hears. Now, in Exodus chapter 3 through 5, the story shifts. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in there because you're probably familiar with the story. But it shifts from Israel back over to Moses. And he has this encounter with the burning bush. You're probably familiar with it. And God basically sends them to shepherd Israel. And essentially, the argument is, Moses, um, I'm going to free my people and I want you to do it. You know how you've been shepherding these sheep out here? Um, I want you to now shepherd my people on behalf of me. And Moses is really reluctant. He doesn't want to do it. And he's coming up with all kinds of excuses. Uh, no one's going to listen to me. Who do I tell them when, that, when I show up? Like, who do, I, who do I say sent me? And, and, and when they even believe that it's you, like, how do I prove that? How do I prove that you have the power? And God's like, all right, um, take your staff and throw it down on the ground. Boom, snake. And then Moses, like, jumps. I don't know. To me, that's probably like an argument. That you're right. I imagine he probably wasn't a very good shepherd. Like, he's getting spooked at snakes, right? You can just imagine what happens when like a bear shows up. <laughs> Moses, nine more sheep got eaten today. I know there's three coyotes. You know how I feel about coyotes. <laughs> so God's like, look, I've got a bigger task for you. So eventually he ends up back in Egypt. He gets back up with his brother Aaron. And they decide after they show these amazing miracles to uh, the Israelites. And their response is like, oh, I'll come on. Okay, cool. God, 
Let's do it. Like, God's going to save us. Let's do it. And, and it's, it's like us typically. Like, you know, when we, we see God showing his hands strong, we think that the moment everything's going to change. It's kind of like a, a worship service like this. We come in with this heavy burden and then worship that we have an amazing time of worship and you just kind of tears streaming down and you just feel like, man, things are going to be okay. It's going to be good. And then you walk out and there's just like, no, the same garbage on the ride home that you, you had on the way here. And just like, where's the end of this thing? God is like, if you look at the way that I set up seasons, winter, summer, fall, spring, can you take a clue that I like taking my time? You ever watch something grow? It doesn't happen overnight. I like taking my time. And so there's going to be probably 15 more of these services where you're going to be standing there and really feeling the presence of the God and not much is going to change on the outside. But you keep walking this walk, and a year from now, you're going to look back and say, I don't even remember that guy. That's good. I don't even know. I don't even recognize her. And you're going to be standing there having a conversation with your kids, and they're going to walk away, and you're going to say, like, man, I used to lose it in situations like that, and I feel nothing but love and peace because I'm just my kids. I've got so much compassion for them. Like, I don't even, what happened? i tell you what happened long transition period of Jesus getting inside of your heart and molding you from the inside out is starting to show, but it takes a long time. And when we don't see things happen when we want them to happen, we start get frustrated and we start complaining. And that's what happened to Israel because as soon as they hear that salvation is coming, they're all about it. And they send Moses and Aaron, go, 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 Moses, go show them the, uh, the leprosy thing. That'll get them. Do that. Do that in front of them. Yeah, throw the stick, do the stick thing that you showed. I don't like snakes, but do that in front of Pharaoh and we'll see what he has to say. Well, he goes to Pharaoh and Pharaoh's response is, I'm not letting your people go. In fact, I'm going to make it even worse for him because I'm offended that you would even come to me and ask this. And so through Exodus chapter three through five, Pharaoh refuses the offer to let God's people go and let them worship in the wilderness. And Israel's response is to complain. Now go over to Exodus chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. I want to read you God's response to Pharaoh and to Israel's complaining. And here's where we're going to lay on the plane today. Exodus chapter 6, but the Lord said to Moses. Now before I read this, because this is a heavy language, before I read this, everything that I just described happened, but I just want to revisit it real quick. So Israel is complaining, like, like, oh, now we got to build more bricks with less clay. Thanks, Moses. Take your staff somewhere else. Leprosy jokes. None of for me, thank you. Now I'm working double shifts, and I got less material. And Pharaoh's standing back, and he's all angry, and he's like, how dare you even come to me? I'm never going to let your people. God who? I've got, I've got plenty of gods. Exodus chapter 6, verse 1, but the Lord says to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, Now I want you to picture this. God is saying to Moses, I am the Lord, okay? I'm God. Not you, not Pharaoh, not those fake little idols that are half dog and half bird. I'm God. I'm in charge. I appeared to Abraham. I appeared to Isaac. I appeared to Jacob as God Almighty. I revealed myself as I saw fit. I'm in charge. But my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. But I did to you in the burning bush. Now you know my name. I'm choosing to show up on your behalf and to start raining down some fury. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of my people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with acts of great judgment. 
We stand back and say, but I don't know, God, this job seems like it's not going anywhere. And his response is, hold up, I'm God. I invented this thing you call jobs. I also invented the ocean and air and stars. I can get you another job. We overwhelm ourselves with anxiety about things we cannot control, and yet we serve a God who invented all of that stuff and by his own admission says, I'm in control. The walk of a Christian is a walk of learning how to put yourself to death, to not be in control, to learn all of the ways that he is superior and submitting and resting in that. You don't need to be driving. You are a terrible driver. Every time you crawled into the seat, you wrecked the car. Sit in the passenger seat and let him drive. You'll be amazed at the things that you will see along the journey. God is about to unleash over the next few chapters some of the most unbelievable fury over Egypt that you could ever imagine. I mean, the creativity that he displays in some of these plagues is pretty amazing. I couldn't have thought of how, like, how good some of this stuff is. All right, total darkness. God, that's really good. Even when you light a candle, it doesn't work? Yep. God, that's really good, God. How about frogs everywhere? Oh, I don't like frogs. Yeah, well, they're in your oven. They're in your pillow. They're everywhere. I mean, the length of fury that he's going to go to to demonstrate I am God is astounding. In this chapter six, in the very beginning, we see God saying, look, it's time to pull my people in. They've been wandering for years and I want them to be mine but it's also time to judge the wicked. Now, I wanted you to read this book, especially these first six chapters, In the Shadow of the Cross. And what I mean by that is this is not just a story about Moses and Israel and Pharaoh. This is bigger than Israel and Egypt. This is about Jesus. This story I want, I want this story to remind you that Jesus is a better Moses, but I also want to remind you that this story is about a freedom from not just earthly slavery, but eternal slavery. I want the story to remind you that just like Moses came to free the people and Jesus came to die and raise from the dead, Jesus is going to come again. And when he does, he is also going to bring the full fury of heaven on this earth. That's essentially what the book of of Revelation is about. This concept that God is going to pour out his wrath on the wicked is not just one thing that happened. This is all a shadow of what's coming. Our king is coming again, and we are promised that he is going to judge the wicked and purge the earth. And one of the things we need to be prepared for is the reality that that's going to come It's easy to read Exodus as a history book and miss, no, This is actually preparation for what's coming. This is not just something that happened in the past. This is something that you look to in the past to inform the future. You will learn and your heart will be ready for what Jesus is doing now and what he's doing in the future if you become a student of what he has done in the past. See, our God, he doesn't change. He purged Egypt and Egypt is just a simple parable for the world and he will come and he will purge the world. And let me tell you, you don't want to be on the wrong side of his fury. You know that feeling you get when you were growing up and one of your brothers and sisters were in trouble and man, they were just getting it from dad in the other room and you could just hear the cries, I'll never do it again. You know what I'm talking about? Your heart is equal parts. I am so glad it's not me. And also, God, that's got to be terrible. The reality of it is that that fury that's coming for the earth, that was the father's wrath. And the kid in the other room was Jesus, your big brother, taking the punishment for what you actually did. 
And what I want to do as we read through the book of Exodus is I want our hearts to be turned. Turned from this idea that this is some old story that we listen. It's like watching the History Channel. Like Some of it's applicable. Like I don't know if I can really. All of it. All of it from Jesus' own mouth is revealing Jesus to us. And if something is going to give me more clearer understanding of Jesus, I want it. As a pastor, that's what I want for you. My desire, my whole purpose in teaching Exodus and Joshua and Hebrews over the next few months is I want you to learn how to read this book in the shadow of the cross. We're going to practice with Exodus and Joshua, but I want you to learn how to read every word as a reminder of what's coming. I want your heart to be stirred when you read this stuff. I want your affections to be turned toward Christ. I don't want this to just be words on the page. I want you to read when God says, I am the Lord. I want you to say, yes, you are. You're my Lord. Yes, you are my King. You're mine. You saved me. You saved me and you brought me into a family and you made me belong when I didn't belong and you gave me a family and an identity and you gave me a way to live and it is my joy to respond to that. Yes, you are Lord. You are Lord here, but you are Lord of my life right now. I want you to be my king. I don't want to just, I just want to say your name when we come to church. I don't want to just talk about you like you're just some fat. I want you to be so real to me that it's, it's like tangible. I can touch it. Every time I feel oppressed or trapped or feel like I'm in slavery, when I read this book, I'm reminded you always keep your word and it's not going to be like this for long. Every moment you feel like you hit a wall, it's a bad day, a bad month, a bad year. The good news is it doesn't last forever. The promise is eternal joy on the other side of this. Exodus 1 through 6 teaches us two main things. Jesus always hears your prayers, and Jesus always saves. Mm-hmm.